My name's John Harris. I'm a chartered accountant and I also farm. And uh, along with my friend and colleague, Richard Wilborn, who is a farm manager in Norfolk, we've been researching the Hess case for the last 35 years. Our starting point was in 1987 when Rudolf Hess died. And every, every night we'd normally congregate in the local pub and talk about the day's events. And one of the day's events in August 87 was that Hess had died. And the papers were speculating or regurgitated the old stories as to why he had flown to Scotland in May 1941. And typically we didn't believe a word of it. And we thought, well, we can probably find out what was actually going on. Uh, there was few books about the subject at that time. Those that had been written were trying to exonerate uh, typically uh, family relatives. So Wolf Hess, Rudolf Hess's son, had written a book in 1984 saying uh, Rudolf was duped by British intelligence. The Duke of Hamilton's son, uh, James, had written a book in 1970 saying my father didn't know anything at all about it and we weren't altogether sure that that was the case either but what we both realized was that it was a very ungermanic act if if you believe the nazi party communique of may 1941 which said that rudolf hess was delusional and stole a plane and flew to the enemy. And that's what we really didn't believe. And that's what we've spent the last 35 years trying to find out and ascertain what did actually happen. What I would say um, is that James Douglas Hamilton, who wrote the book in 1971, Motive for a Mission, uh, it's a good book, uh, but it certainly isn't a complete explanation by any means. He unfortunately died last month and um, my business partner and I are travelling to Edinburgh later on today with a view to attending his memorial service in the morning. So that's very much the end of another generation. So he, it was his father who was the Duke of Hamilton that Hess supposedly came in to see. And now the next generation unfortunately has also died. Rudolf Hess's son, Wolf, who I've already mentioned, he died in 2001. And, what, and as these people start falling off the perch, it makes immediacy that much more difficult mm -hmm. and yeah. recollection that much more difficult. Because yeah, well, it's got, so, I mean, at the time, I think you could imagine the secrecy surrounding this. Um, uh, you know, the deputy leader of the Third Reich suddenly uh, appears in Scotland flying in his Messerschmitt. Can you just take us through uh, what we know about the actual trip itself, the timing of it as regards the German um, side was really uh, just before the Germans um, tore up the treaty, the molotov ribbentrop Treaty, and uh, in Barbarossa did a surprise attack on the Soviet Union. Uh, in 1941 uh, well I'd say just before it was a little bit before and I, I mean the general premise seems to be that Hess was trying to get to Britain in order to do some sort of a peace deal so just leaving that aside what happened what aircraft did he use where did he fly from and when okay so um, Rudolf Hess flew from Augsburg which was essentially a, a Messerschmitt factory as well his 110 wasn't made there it was uh, made at a place called Regensburg which is just the other side of Munich but Hess was using the Augsburg Hounstetten airfield as his training base and had been doing so for some months so his first flight in the plane that he ended up in Scotland in was in December of 1940 so the idea that he suddenly stole a plane is absolute crass he had been training and learning the finer details of the Messerschmitt 110, the particular plane that he used since Christmas of 1940. He took off uh, at quarter to six 
on May the 10th, 1941, and he crashed at Eaglesham, just outside Glasgow to the south, at 11 minutes, uh, sorry, at nine minutes past 11. OK, so this was an Spain evening Eagle. flight. I mean, he, he, he'd taken off in the evening. Uh, can you can you just explain? Well, early evening and he arrived a little bit later. Uh, so can you just explain the route he took, how he navigated, where he was heading? Yeah. So we, we've spent a lot of time and effort looking at the German navigation systems and the German naviga- German radio navigation systems were more advanced than the British navigation systems at the start of the war. Why? Because the Germans needed to navigate their way to be able to bomb cities. And the British, na- uh, the British radio or radar was far more advanced than the Germans, but that was of a defensive nature. So the Germans had set up an early system called Electra, which was a derivative of the blind landing system that the Lorenz AG German company had been selling throughout the 1930s across the world. And what it did, uh, the, the landing system basically put a beam down the runway to enable a plane to fly down the radio beam knowing that if it flew down the said beam, it would land in the middle of the runway, hence the the phrase blind landing. And uh, Dr. Kramer at Lorenz in the late 30s had the brilliant brainwave of looking at it the other way and extending the beam away from the runway. And when the Germans invaded Norway in uh, April 1940, That invasion took somewhat longer than the French invasion. It didn't finish until mid-June. But as soon as they'd got control of the Norwegian airspace and and, uh, territory, they they built their own um, radio navigation system at a place called Vahag, V-A-R-H-A-U-G, which is just about 15 kilometres south of Stavanger, on the western coast of Norway. We travelled there three weeks ago to make sure that it wasn't a false report. And sure enough, we managed to find the remnants of the radio base itself. And what that did was essentially put a spoke of radio beams across the North Sea. So anybody flying up the North Sea, such as Rudolf Hess, could tell virtually precisely where they were relative to the radio beams. And obviously they had a chart which printed where the beams were. So by that device, you could count the amount of spokes that you passed through and you could ascertain virtually precisely where you were. As far as Rudolf Hess was concerned, it was terribly important to know when to turn left uh, and hit the British coast. If he turned too early, then he had come in over the Newcastle air defences. If he turned too late, he would come in over the Edinburgh air defences. There are a whole string of RAF bases along the Firth of Forth, such as uh, McMerry, Drem and East Fortune. And what he was aiming at was the window in between those two, uh, two extremes. And that was some of the least defended airspace in Britain. It was also notable that the least defended airspace in Britain was nominally under the control of the Duke of Hamilton, who Hess had been trying to communicate with uh, both prior to the Second World War and during the Second World War. So that's a brief uh, resume of the navigation system that he employed. OK, well, look, just before we get into what happened, uh, what went wrong, why he had to bail out. Uh, do you know, was there actually any evidence of communication between Hess and the British um, before he took this flight? Oh, yes. So in July 1939, Hess had a British expert called Albrecht Haushofer, and he was um, a close friend of the Duke of Hamilton's. 
Uh, he was so close, in fact, that the Duke of Hamilton invited him to his wedding in November 1937, I think, to Lady Elizabeth Percy. Um, and Haushofer had written to um, the Duke of Hamilton in July 1939. He had also written to the Duke of Hamilton in September 1940 via a 76-year-old lady based in Cambridge who was a close family friend of the Haushofers. And the idea there was that um, Haushofer would write to Mrs Roberts and Mrs Roberts would then pass the letter on to the Duke of Hamilton. And that's really the start of where it all went wrong. The letter was duly sent in September 1940, but it was intercepted by the British postal censor and copies of the letter were sent to MI5, MI6 and SOE, the, new, the newly created uh, Special Operations Executive. So, yes, there had been communication between the parties. There is also the role of Tancred Berenius, a Finnish art historian to consider. He was dispatched by MI6 in January 1941 to Geneva, uh, where he spoke to Karl Burkhardt, the uh, head of the International Red Cross. And Burkhardt straight away reported the conversation to Haushofer, who in turn reported it to Hess. So I think we do know for sure of that communication. What is speculation, Tony, is whether or not it extended beyond January 41 uh, in the lead up to the flight in May 1941. I think we do have some evidence of a continued communication, but it's probably not sufficient to satisfy the academic historians. No, well, no, not almost nothing is. Uh, and they, of course, uh, of uh, they tend to stick to the official version of history. Um, but look, uh, OK, so let's imagine Hess in his uh, Messerschmitt 110, a twin engine, very fast, quite uh, sort of top of the range aircraft uh, over the North Sea, about to turn left, trying to get uh, the right heading between Edinburgh and Newcastle. Uh, where was he heading and what happened? OK, so we believe he was heading for RAF Dundonald, which is a controversial statement because it was an operational RAF base just beneath Glasgow. Why do we think RAF Donald, uh, Dundonald? Well, a number of reasons. Number one, um, it's marked by inference on the flight map that Hess brought with him. Number two, it was a quiet RAF base. It had just recently um, been emptied of uh, navigational students. So on that Saturday, there weren't many people about. And thirdly, it was under the direct operational command again of the Duke of Hamilton. So that's why we believe uh, Dundonald was the um, intended target. But as far as Rudolf Hess was concerned, the BF 110 was a huge plane. Uh, it was twin engined. Uh, in my farming career, I've got, a, I've got s some tractors which are typically about 100 horsepower each, and they're quite substantial machines. Um, the, the Hess plane had 2,000 horsepower engines, 10 times uh, the size of my tractor engine. So they were pretty, that was pretty huge, and they were sopping fuel at the rate of around 660 litres per hour. So that's where the timings come in uh, to importance, because he took off at 5.45, crashed at seven minutes past 11. That's roughly five hours, 24 minutes. And a Messerschmitt 110 held just short of 1,300 litres of fuel in its tanks. And so consequently, it could only typically fly for around about two hours. So there's been a lot of speculation in the past that, oh, well, it couldn't have been the Hess plane because he couldn't have carried enough fuel. 
Ostensibly, that is, of course, the case. But what Hess had got, in addition to the, the fuel tanks in the wing, was um, twin auxiliary fuel tanks. And the Luftwaffe supplied those in um, 300, 600, 900 litre sizes. And there's quite a lot of evidence to support the fact that Hess had got two 900 litre uh, fuel tanks. That meant that he'd got circa 3,000 litres of fuel on board when he took off. So as far as fuel was concerned, he hadn't got a problem. He'd got sufficient fuel to make the flight that we know uh, took place. However, where life gets somewhat more interesting is that the Messerschmitt 110 had two huge Daimler Benz 601 engines, as I've said, and they were of a dry sump uh, design, which meant that oil was actually utilised, not recycled. So it would use oil at a rate of between seven and nine litres per hour. And behind each of these huge engines were a 35 litre oil tank. So simple mathematics means that if, it, if the engines were, being, uh, were using oil at nine litres per hour, then the plane could only fly for four hours, which we know uh, it supposedly uh, flew for five hours, 24 minutes. So it's the oil, which is the interesting issue. And the Luftwaffe obviously had thought of that too. So it also had an auxiliary oil tank um, option that could be fitted. And the, uh, the radio operator in the, in the plane would pump the oil through to the engine tank from the auxiliary tank. Unfortunately, in the Hess affair, there was no um, radio operator. So consequently, there was nobody to uh, pump any oil. And the, in the fuselage, which still resides at Duxford to this day, um, there is no auxiliary oil tank either. Uh, instead, there's a big brass nut that is wired in place. So Hess certainly did not have an auxiliary oil tank. And that then, this is quite old information. We, we've probably discussed this before, Tony. Because there was no auxiliary oil tank fitted, Hess could not have flown for five hours, 24 minutes without his engine seizing through loss of oil. And it's that basic fact that has driven us to do more work. And we now are absolutely convinced that he landed en route at a place called Gießen in northern Germany, refueled and re-oiled, enabled him to take off again with sufficient fuel and oil to land and fly as he did to, um, to Lowland Scotland. From Gießen, he flew up the North Sea at an angle of 335 degrees. How do we know that? That's on a map that um, the ploughman that arrested him on, um, uh, on, on landing tore from his knee. And that was a navigational chart that we were sent a copy of years ago. And then the issue becomes when to turn left, as you quite rightly say, between um, the Edinburgh air defences and the Newcastle air defences. And it's at that point that think the flight began to unravel. Um, when Hess wrote years later to his wife, who lived in Bavaria after the war, from his prison cell in Spandau in Berlin, he bemoaned the fact that at the decisive moment, as he called it, i.e. went to turn left, his radio compass failed him. And we take that to mean that he lost contact with the radio navigation system. And so consequently, he didn't know for sure when to turn left. So what he did was, as any other good pilot would do, he flew around in a circle and retraced his tracks. And that retracing of his tracks took him 40 minutes longer 
than he had anticipated. And what he hadn't realised, that that 40 minutes was the difference between light and day. We believe he was going to land at Dundonald at round about 10.30 at night precisely, just as it was getting dark. So his plane would land at an operational RAF base and fade into the night. As it was, he was 40 minutes late. It was pretty pitch dark and he couldn't see to land. And that's why he then took the decision to parachute out and become public property. And in become- well, I mean, he might he might have decided he was, he was going to take his chances as well. But can you just explain what was the point of do- going back on yourself uh, when you? OK, so he's he's lost his bearings, basically. Uh, if the radio navigation, it could even be that it, that, that, that the um, Nazis had switched it off for whatever reason. Maybe they didn't think there was a bombing raid. They didn't need it that night or whatever. And um, or maybe they knew where he was, knew what he was up to and switched it off on purpose. We don't know. But what was the point of turning round and going back on yourself an extra 40 minutes? Uh, how is that going to help him to find his way? Um, because that I've got a cousin in the RAF. And if you lose your bearings, that's what you do. So. You can't tell your it's not if you get lost in a car you can pull into a lay by take out your map and work out where you are and not be in jeopardy in a plane over the sea you don't have that option you've got to keep doing something and so consequently it's i understand in our in the raf that is the standard process you go round in a circle retrace your tracks gather your thoughts, try and work out where you are. Hopefully the radar, uh, the radio navigation system might cut in uh, and restart. What I should say as well, Tony, is that the navigation system, Electra, was not that particularly easy to understand. So when you crossed a spoke, there was a continual line Either side of the spoke, there was a series of dots and dashes, and you had to count the dots and dashes to make 60. So if, for instance, you'd got the wrong amount of dots or the wrong amount of dashes, it could be pilot error. Now, Rudolf Hess chose to blame the system to his wife rather than to admit to human error. As I understand it, most accidents in the air ultimately come down to human error, um, particularly at that time. So that's what we believe. uh, That's why we believe he did what he did. It was basically standard practice um, to try and reestablish where you were, because all you've got to see is literally water um, at 360 degrees around you. There's no visible landmark. Uh, halfway across the North Sea. He crossed the coast at Dunstanborough Castle in Northumberland at 10.23, went across central lowland Scotland, so St Mary's Lock, Hoyk, uh, around about 10.35 there. Then uh, when he hit St Mary's Lock, he went slightly to the north to put him on track for a landing at Dundonald and eventually hit the coast of the Clyde, um, the Clyde estuary at a place called um, West Kilbride. He knew he was in trouble at that point because apparently, again, we've asked aviation experts, the first thing that you lose when it gets dark is the land, is the ground. So he flew down, uh, flew down the uh, Clyde estuary and doubled back looking towards Dundonald. But unfortunately, in between him at that point and Dundonald Airfield was the biggest munitions factory in the country at that time, ICI Ardea. And that was protected by 28 barrage balloons. So he managed to avoid that, still knew he was north of Dundonald and went south towards it, 
But by that time, it was self-evident he wasn't going to be able to land. We think at that time, he then tried to find Dungable House, which was the ancestral home of the Duke of Hamilton, and try and get as close to that before he bailed out. But unfortunately, confused Eaglesham House, which uh, is a very, a very similar house and a very similar design, near to a res- reservoir. Both houses were adjacent to a reservoir confused the two and chose at that point to bail out. He must have been out virtually out of fuel as well at that time. So I think those were the uh, deciding factors in, in him bailing out where he did. But as soon as he had bailed out, he then fell into government hands and essentially his mission was at, at an end. Uh, was there ever any chance that he might have been able to bury his parachute? I mean, it sounds quite amazing, really, that he, he was pounced on so quickly, so late at night. Um, well, not really, because he was quite close to quite close to Glasgow. Glasgow was, again, some of the most heavily defended airspace in Britain at that time, given its um, military capability. Glasgow had also suffered very heavy raids in March '41. May 41. So they were ready and waiting for any uh, German invade, uh, any German intruders. Uh, so I'm, I'm not surprised that Hess got apprehended as quickly as he did. And okay. more, more well, over, Tony, yeah. an ME110, which weighed seven and a half tonnes, crashing into um, the soil is not ever going to be a covert landing, is it? Well, no, well, no, but I mean, I'm sure he bailed out. How far away was the aircraft? Did that crash from where he bailed out? It must have been a fair distance away. OK, so you've hit upon another dilemma. Um, you would think that the, st- the story that we've been told is that the plane, um, Hess knew he couldn't land, so he flew the plane to 4,000 feet and bailed out, and he struggled to bail out. So the plane, we are told, crashed from a height of 4,000 feet. Uh, It is remarkable, in my view, that Hess and the plane crashed in the same field, given that, given those parameters. You would think that the plane would have glided for, I don't know, a couple of miles perhaps before crashing, and a parachute clearly would go down to using gravity. And Definitely. The, I mean, it, yeah, the other thing is, from, from his point of view, he would almost certainly have throttled it right back, possibly even switched the engines off uh, to make sure that it wasn't going too fast when he when he bailed out. The last thing you want is to be, uh, you know, hit by a tail or but anyway, you know, you would want it to be reasonably covert. So just to leave the aircraft gliding forward, maybe, a, a, you know, a couple of hundred miles an hour, maybe even slower. Uh, with no engines on is but most definitely going to be his choice of a situation to bail out in and and that is going to certainly travel i mean i would guess several miles before um hitting the ground from four thousand feet and you don't want to be lower than that if you're parachuting out really precisely the but the story goes that um the the 110 is actually quite a difficult aircraft to to leave in any case in an emergency so the um the canopy folds back and he tried to get out in level flight and he couldn't because of the air pressure. So his one of his stories uh, or one of his letters to his son describe him uh, virtually going vertical with the aircraft and flipping out once it once it had achieved almost flying vertically um, he, he, he virtually fell out of the aircraft because it was the only way of avoiding the air pressure. Well, look, upwards or downwards, I suppose, is the question. I suppose you would have to be trying to fly upwards. The last thing you want to do is try and get out of an aircraft that's in a vertical dive and going faster oh, and no, faster no, no, all the time. Other way, other way, the plane was going up, not down. Yeah. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, so definitely. Yeah, OK, that's not, it doesn't make much sense to be heading downwards when you're trying to bail out, no. Certainly, certainly not. No, no, I don't think anybody's suggesting that. But where the debate is, is whether or no. So you can see today the remnants of the plane. There are two engines which 
are, are in pretty good condition. One's in East Fortune uh, Air, Air Museum. The other, the other is in Duxford Air Museum. Both are in quite good condition. The fuselage is also in RAF Duxford. What we've never seen is the cockpit, for reasons I'll go into in a little while, but um, we've all seen time team and programmes like that where crashed aircraft are dug out from a huge hole in the ground 20 or 30 deep, uh, 20 or 30 foot deep. These engines and these fuselages certainly were not uh, anywhere near uh, damaged to that extent. It's almost as if the plane has been crash landed. And that's that's the other debate. Was Hess lying about the parachute? Because I don't think I think there's only one person that alleges to have seen a parachute. Um, whereas there are stories about helping Hess uh, out of a crashed plane. So a lot of people think that Hess actually crash landed the plane. And that explains A, why he's in the same field as the plane and B, why the plane is so uh, well, why the plane components are so undamaged. Yeah, well, absolutely right. And uh, and the other thing, of course, is uh, he's obviously a proficient pilot. It's uh, it's fairly easy if you've got a bit of time. I mean, obviously, the light was potentially not very good. I don't know what whether it was a full moon. What was was there, was there much light around? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it was a light. right. Well, you see, in which case, a, a good pilot will just pick uh, a field uh, and they'll pick it to, uh, and uh, you know, long uh, elongated field that's reasonably level, uh, and you can have a fairly fairly good chance of a decent. I mean, you could call it a crash landing, but an emergency landing in a field like that. Very good. So then the debate goes as to why would Rudolf Hess or why would the authorities try and make the story that he had parachuted when he had actually crash landed the plane? Why, why would that news management take place? And the only explanation we've ever come up with that I think is vaguely satisfactory is that a parachute is a very random act whereas a crash landing is a very pre-planned, um, a pre-planned event, is it that by promulgating the story of a parachute landing, it tries to infer that it was a random act of a madman? So we're back... Yeah, to, well, he's panicking, you know, that sort of thing. Pan- it's, it's the, it's the uh, delusional madman stealing the plane and flying to the enemy and then jumping out it reinforces that that uh, story almost. Um, I think we believe the the likelihood is he crash landed the plane. Because the other point I'd make is that at that time, parachuting was very much in its infancy, and parachuting out of a plane was very much a last resort. Um, right, you know, it's it's not. It wasn't the uh, uh, recognised safety device that it, that it is today. Uh, yeah, well, sure. I mean, the thing is, a lot of uh, 110 pilots, I'm sure, and their crews uh, over the years, uh, around, you know, in, at this point during the war, you know, a couple of years after it, the war started, I'm sure would have been having to used to be bailed out, having been shot down by uh, in, fighters, by British yeah. fighters um, over the channel and part of the Battle of Britain. So, I mean, you know, I would have thought that that most many aircraft would have had specific procedures to bail out. But uh, the other thing, of course, is if you're doing an emergency landing, um, then that can easily in a rutted field turn into a crash landing. Uh, So that may be what we're looking at here. Anyway, I know you've been doing you're constantly doing work on this, as you say, you know, at the weekend going to this um, memorial service, for example. What's your, your latest books? Can you just tell us a bit about those, John? So we, we, the two most recent, um, I'll do the easy one first. The, 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 the most recent is um, the Haag Electra and Sonna, the Rudolf Hess flight book, and that concentrates on Hess and his interaction with the German navigation systems. And we're pretty happy with that book, and we've got some pretty good experts uh, agreeing with our 
theory. There's a chap called Dr. Philip Judkins, who's um, a member of or, or chairman of the defence, DEHS, um, Defence Electronic History Society. And he thinks we're absolutely spot on the mark with that. Um, and then the second book is more political. And that's where life gets more difficult because there's less evidence that you can refer to. Uh, but I think we're, we've done quite a lot of work on the political aspect, as per usual, just drilling down into detail. And the particular detail that we've drilled down into significantly, I think, since probably we last spoke, Tony, is that pertaining to the role of the Polish government in exile and how they were quite a significant political force in lowland Scotland in May 41. And bizarrely, uh, Tony, that they mounted an assassination attempt um, to try and kill Hess on the 19th of May 1941, i.e. 10 days after, well, nine days after Hess had actually landed in Scotland. And we think if we can understand that, we can understand a lot of the motivation behind the flight itself. Slowly, I think the, the picture is becoming reasonably clear. Can you say something about what happened after he was captured and how he ended up in Spandau prison in Berlin after the war? Because for many people, uh, there is some confusion about who ran Spandau. I know one of the weirdest stories is uh, to do with his death, but also about the fact that he was the only inmate for many years of Spandau prison. So what happened after the ploughman or whoever it was arrested him okay. when, he, when he crash landed? Pretty clear chronology there. I think. So uh, he crashed at nine minutes past 11. He was taken to the um, spectacular um, location of Busby Masonic Hall uh, initially, which was a couple of miles away. That was the HQ of the local home guard. From there, he went to Gifnock Scout Hall, and that was the HQ of the local police and the local uh, home, home guard again. And he was interrogated there by a pole called Roman Battaglia. From there, still on the same night, he ended up at Mary Hill Barracks in Glasgow. From there, the following day, he was taken to Buchanan Castle on the banks of Loch Lomond. That was a military hospital. And then on the 17th of May, he was taken down to London and spent four or five days in the Tower of London, incidentally in the same room as Guy Fawkes had been uh, interned in. And from the Tower of London, he then went to um, Mitchett Court, which is by Aldershot, and then spent the last two years uh, of the war in Abergavenny in, uh, in South Wales. And then in October 1945, he flew out of RAF Maidley in Herefordshire to Nuremberg. He uh, was imprisoned along with the other Nazi war criminals in Nuremberg and uh, he was sentenced to life imprisonment in 1946 and in July 47 he was moved to his eventual uh, prison which was Spandau in Berlin. Spandau in Berlin was in the west of Berlin and all of Germany at that time was uh, under the control of the four powers, Russia, the US, Britain and France. And those four powers took it in turns to guard Rudolf Hess from 1947 to 1987. When now, this, is, this is a bit peculiar, isn't it? Because this is actually in West Berlin, uh, the Allied control side. And yet you're saying that the Russians were actually at certain periods in charge of this jail. Yeah, it was it was done on a rotational basis. On, I think a monthly on a monthly rotor. So every month 
the four powers would rotate and be nominally in charge of that prison. Now, when in 1947, it wasn't just Rudolf Hess, there was seven there were seven uh, Nazi war criminals. And in 1966, the by by 1966, they had all been released. The last one before Rudolf Hess was Albert Speer, uh, Hitler's architect. He was released in 66. Well, so, hang on, because hang on, gee, he was also the armament minister as well as the architect. Yeah. Yes, very much so. It, it, he was an architect, but he was promoted to the armaments minister of production. And under him, um, Nazi war production never ceased to increase virtually until the latter days of the war. And I mean, it's very significant uh, him being an architect because he was designing all sorts of like mass build. I mean, for example, the Nuremberg Stadium where Hitler was holding his rallies was designed by Speer. As, as well as um, I think it's called Pura, which is one of the big camps where they used to send all the young children, thousands, the whole, the whole thousands of them. Yeah. The whole, the whole uh, as well as some of their military architecture was designed by Speer. So uh, I, I wonder whether they chit chatted with each other in there. Any idea? Um, yes, up to a point, but I don't think there was any much love lost between the higher echelons of the Nazi uh, party either. Um, but Speer, Speer and Hess certainly did talk to one another. There's a very good book by a lady called uh, Greta Sereni on Speer, and she deal she deal she deals with that issue herself. But Speer anyway was released in '66. He died in London bizarrely in 1981, and meanwhile Rudolf Hess, for the last 21 years of his life was the solitary inmate in in Spandau. Yeah, I mean, this is really an extraordinary thing. I mean, surely there were efforts by the Allies uh, or somebody to say, well, look, it's about time we release this guy. Uh, there were huge efforts, uh, not least by his family, of course. There was a uh, sp- sp- specific German uh, relief organisation created to try and obtain his release. That failed, despite former presidents of the German Republic being committee members. Um, And the convenient explanation was that the Russians would never allow his release. And it may be significant to note that in 1987, the Russian economy was uh, failing. Uh, You may remember the phrases perestroika and glasnost. Well, that uh, that was very much Russian for we're running out of money. Please help. Well, that's right. And I think it wasn't in 89 uh, that the Berlin Wall came down. So this was, a Correct. you know, there was it was a kind of meltdown going on the uh, Soviet side, the Eastern German side. Correct. And when it looked as if the Russians might be amenable to releasing Hess, uh, lo and behold, he dies. So. so the- do you want to say something about that? Because there's been quite a lot written about suggestions that that, that this wasn't uh, suicide, uh, as the official story went at the time. And I know one thing is that the United States was actually in charge of the jail when it happened. Um, OK, the Hess death. We're never going to know the truth. Um, but what I can tell you, and, and it's quite a simple, simple statement. There were two autopsies performed. The first one was by the British authorities and a chap called Cameron uh, performed the autopsy. And he said quite categorically it was suicide. Um, Hess had managed to hang himself. The family, the Hess family didn't believe that and they employed a German physician called Spann from Munich University who came up with a different conclusion. Um, the Spann conclusion was that he, that he had been um, strangulated or strangled. So it depends who you believe. 
you might choose to believe the British interpretation and that is a suicide or you might choose to believe the German interpretation and that is strangulation. We're not going to know that we're not going to know the truth. There are pictures of bruising uh, of the neck, which Span would tell you was proof of strangulation because they're horizontal bruises. And if you manage to hang yourself, your bruising tends to be more triangulated rather than horizontal, which I understand. But I'm not sure the means of his death or the method of his death is the important point. The important point was that he was killed or he died at that point. So he could never he could never be in the public arena and give a explanation as to why he flew to Scotland in 1941. Another point, Tony, is you would think, would you not, that if you were on trial for your life in Nuremberg in 1946, you might think to say, well, I, I'm a good guy, really. I flew to save, uh, I flew to make peace and uh, sort out the war in 1941. Instead, Hess said not a word about why he flew to Scotland or was he invited to fly to Scotland in 1941. Instead, he made a couple of rambling statements. He feigned amnesia in the first instance. And so an observer was no in was in no better position to understand the Hess rationale and motivation for the flight after Nuremberg than before it. So essentially, from May 1941 to August 1987, he was pretty well silenced. The only aberration or the only threat, I suppose, was if it stood up and said, this is why I flew to Scotland in 1941 at Nuremberg. But he chose not to. And you must make your own mind up as to why that is. Uh, ultimately, then, uh, you believe, do you, that he, there was uh, a, a realistic prospect of uh, some sort of move against Churchill and some kind of peace breaking out between the Nazis and the British uh, when Hess flew? All I can tell you is that the Poles certainly thought that. So the Polish government in exile were also based in Scotland. And they were so convinced that some form of settlement was going to be reached that would no doubt sell Poland down the river, as indeed eventually happened, that they chose to try and assassinate Hess to stop that process taking place. Sorry, to, to stop that process taking place. So they had penciled in a date of May the, 7th, uh, May the 19th to uh, kidnap him and murder him, presumably when he was travelling down to London from Scotland. But I think the British got wind of that. MI5, the little diaries say that they got, wind, they understood, they got to learn about that and they moved him two days earlier on the 17th and that thwarted the plot. So certainly the Polish government in exile, who were pretty close to the British in a lot of ways at that time, thought there was sufficient justification for them to launch an, an assassination attempt. Now that's pretty uh, spectacular in, it, in itself, is it not? That a Polish, uh, that a government in exile, uh, uh, see fit to launch an assassination attempt on your host's territory. Well, yes, I mean it's, it's, it's pretty good evidence. Um, the other thing is he landed quite close to, well, reasonably close to Don Donald underneath, uh, just south of Glasgow. Yeah. Is there any evidence of who was waiting for him there? If there was some sort of arranged meeting about to take no place, idea. if he did successfully land? No idea. No idea. Uh, there were there was a book called Double Standards in uh, that was published in 2001. And there was some good research in that book. But the conclusions that they reached, I think, were pretty flawed. And one of their conclusions was that the Duke of Kent was at the end of the runway waiting for him. I think that's absolute nonsense, I have to say. We know where the Duke of Kent was 
at long last. He was in the Orkney Isles. Um, so, uh, to answer your question, I have no idea. And the killer question is what was going to happen had Hess have landed at 10.30 at night at RAF Dundonald. I suspect he was going to be taken to a meeting quite possibly at Dungavel House or there would be some form of summit or, or meeting with those that could influence uh, a negotiated peace. I mean, I mean for, for such an important bit of history, I find it extraordinary that, uh, that you've got the sort of various bits of this Messerschmitt 110 in different parts of the country, in Duxford and elsewhere. Can you tell me where they are and are they actually on public display at all? Like, I remember visiting okay. Moscow years ago, and seeing all the remnants of the U2 of Gary Powers there in the oh, museum. Yeah. There they are, you know, on display, but not this, yeah. uh, you, know, po- you know, even more important bit of history. So wh- can we see these bits and pieces uh, on display somewhere? OK, good question. So the plane crashed in 41, May 41, uh, just south of Eaglesham. It was collected up and taken to RAF Car Luke, which is just... Not, uh, very close to Eaglesham in actual fact. Then it was put on a Queen Mary trailer and it was going to go on a nationwide tour. But unfortunately, somebody decided that that wasn't a good idea. So the parts were then spread asunder for the next 70 or 80 years. So as we sit here today, I can tell you that there is an engine at East Fortune Museum in Scotland. There is another engine in RAF Duxford. The fuselage is at RAF Duxford. A Balkan cruise that was cut from the fuselage is in the RAF Museum in Hendon. Um, the parachute apparently went back to Bavaria, uh, to the Hess family. Most people in Eaglesham in Scotland have a remnant of the plane. They were like magpies descending on that evening. Um, I've been offered personally Rudolf Hess's flare gun. I've been offered various parts of the um, fuselage. I've been offered an instrument. Uh, There is part of the propeller in the Glasgow Police Museum in, I think, Hillhead in Glasgow. So, as you quite rightly say, the bits are spread asunder. The The other bits and bobs are that nobody wants particularly are in RAF Stafford, where you can see some of the oil tanks that were recovered from the wings and a ladder that was used to gain access to to the uh, to the cockpit. What nobody can show me um, is a picture of the cockpit itself. And I'm very suspicious about that because we know that somebody was detailed from the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough to go and recover the blind landing equipment. We even know his name. His name is David Mitchell. And he describes climbing into the cockpit to recover the blind landing equipment. So I find it very odd that nobody has ever been able to show me a picture of the cockpit. Why? I suspect the cockpit was in far more intact condition than um, the official story would seem to uh, to warrant. Uh, so, I mean, so if people are interested in actually going to see the plane, is it feasible? You know, can visitors just go and see it at a museum or do you have to make some sort of special arrangement? No, no, no. At Duxford, it is on public display um, and I could take you to it. It's turn left at the ticketing hall. So, <laughs> You can walk, you can walk and uh, touch it and look inside it. You can see the brass nut. You can see the Siemens KU-4 autopilot that we refer to in our book that enabled the plane to fly in a straight line, which is no mean feat uh, uh, aeronautically. Uh, So, no, it's still very much there. Um, But there's no wings uh, no, no propeller apart from the one in the police station and certainly no cockpit. 
Uh, what about just generally aircraft of this age? Are there any uh, are many? I mean, I think I think the RAF have got a few, uh, but are there many aircraft of this age, German and British, still flying? Uh, still flying, yes. There's a whole host of Spitfires. I think there's probably more Spitfires flying now than there were 20 years ago. Well, that's right. There's a whole industry, isn't there? I know down at Biggin Hill, you can hop in the back of a Spitfire and pay a, a small Absolutely. fortune to go for a flight in one. Absolutely. But uh, as, as for Messerschmitt 110s, very, very, very few of those have survived. There's one at the RAF Museum in Hendon. That's a type g i think which is a night fighter with um, night fighter radar there's one i've seen in the luftwaffe museum in uh, berlin i believe there's some remnants of one in the russian museum that i think you've probably visited uh, and referred to earlier and there are stories of two being restored in new zealand uh, but apart from that, I don't think there's very many Messerschmitts at all. Uh, so maybe one, not. Maybe one, none flying. Not flying. Not airworthy. No. no. Uh, OK, well, look, let's just w- wind up by looking at the politics of all of this, uh, because uh, I know that the I was I remember reading uh, a fascinating account that the, the um, uh, Hitler's Berghof, um, uh, which was down very close to Switzerland, uh, up on the mountains, he used to sort of go up there and uh, run the war or pontificate or contemplate how he was going to take over the world, you know, dominate everything. And um, reading stories of uh, how Hess, and although he was his deputy and he'd known him for many years, didn't eat with uh, didn't eat with Hitler because he didn't like the type of food that Hitler had. And so all of those who were sort of sycophantically uh, being friendly with Adolf uh, would eat together and Hess would eat, have to eat separately. So there was already this kind of almost an alienation, even though they were old friends. And there was certainly an, an attempt by British intelligence to peel away many of his close associates from the 1920s uh, to, to kind of isolate Hitler, really. And, and it could be that this was just simply an MI6 operation to trick Hess out of Hitler's circle to 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 make sure that uh, the people that they thought would be better to be uh, close to Hitler were were and all his old friends were gone. Um, I, I I take your point up up to a point, but we've looked at why so Goering, Bormann, Ribbentrop all had houses on the Berghof, um, which was uh, near to the near to the Berghof, which was the uh, the Hitler house. Hess never did. We thought that was strange. And we've now discovered why that was. So um, Rudolf Hess had his own Berghof equivalent about 120 miles away. So the Berghof is on the road to Salzburg or just off the road to Salzburg from Munich. And Rudolf Hess typically at the weekend. He lived in Munich and he had a weekend retreat at the Algau, A-L-L-G-A-U. And typically he would go down to the Algau most weekends. His wife eventually uh, ended up living there. She spent the rest of her life after 1943 in the Algau. Um, Hess's daughter-in-law still lives there. And he had his own mini Berghof um, there and that's why he didn't spend much time with Hitler he was confident enough to not need to or not want to because he was basically Hitler's oldest friend and where this becomes very significant is that on the Alga which is the, the Hess equivalent to the Berghof he struck up a friendship with a doctor called Dr. Girl G-E-R-L and what girl, girl was an ambitious doctor, an ambitious thyroid expert, and he set up a clinic in Kensington in London, attracting the great and the good. And so his business model would be to, uh, he, he was very close to a lady called Mrs. Calthrop, who, would, who was very connected to the British High Society. She would bring in the patients. The patients would then get shipped off to the Algal, 
And if you were of sufficient standing and status, you'd get to meet Rudolf Hess at the weekends on a social basis. And we've done quite a lot of work on this because we think it's quite important. And when I tell you that the Duke of Hamilton's wife and the Duke of Hamilton's uh, co-pilot when he was flying over Everest were patients of Dr. Girl, as was um, Stanley Baldwin, the British Prime Minister's daughter, it all gets quite close quite quickly. And we thought that that might be another, well, I'm sure it was a, a means of communication, but we suspect that that means of communication ended um, after, the, for, after the war broke out, because clearly there wasn't going to be the means of transporting patients to southern, uh, southern Germany. Mm. So I understand your point that you're making, but I don't think that's the case with Rudolf Hess, because... The reason that Hess wasn't at the Berghof very frequently was that he'd got his own equivalent, not on such a grand scale, admittedly, um, probably about 150 miles away. OK, John. Uh, well, what about uh, the books? Can you just give us the titles and let listeners know where they can get hold of them? Thank you. Um, all the books are on Amazon. We've now written seven. The last two are probably the best that I'd recommend your readers uh, consider. Um, the political one is called Calamity. Uh, sorry, the political one is called uh, Conspiracy, Calamity and Cover Up, which we actually believe uh, describes the Hess affair. And the aeronautical one is um, Bahag, Electra and Son. The British, uh, the Rudolf Hess flight book. Both are published by Unicorn Publishing uh, in where are they, Sussex? And, and I, the, I mean, the, I, I realise this is your up-to-date research, um, but I wonder if there's any of your previous books which might be a sort of introduction for people that haven't really looked into this much before. Um, well, I, if that's the case, a good starter point would be uh, Rudolf Hess Treasure Interception, which is GEMA. J-E-M-A Publications 2016. I mean, there is also uh, a book that I found absolutely fascinating to read about some of the these uh, electronic systems that they were used, that he used to navigate and that, that let him down. Um, is a book which was a number one bestseller, I think it was in the 1980s, called The Most Secret War, which I'd also re thoroughly recommend, British yeah. Scientific Intelligence yeah. in 1939 to 1945 by R.V. Jones. Yeah. And uh, it, it talks a lot about the technology at the time. So, uh, you know, in, in a way, complementary to your um, your thing about the navigation, your book about the navigation aids. Uh, that's also a good read if people haven't come across it before. Very much so. Yeah. Thoroughly recommend it. OK, John Harris, thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you, Tony. Uh, oh, do you have a website which is just about the, uh, the your Hess research by any chance? Yes, yes we do. And that's uh, on Facebook and it's Conspiracy, Calamity and Cover Up. John Harris, thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure, Tony. All best. <laughs>